Bonnie, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I hope the audio is coming through okay. I uh, <clears throat> I apologize. I'm I'm actually in Fort Morgan, Colorado, right now, so couldn't be there with you in uh, Central Illinois. So very uh, good. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen for you, and be right back. So. <clears throat> Awesome, thank you. And um, yeah, I uh, farm up in uh, Henry County, Illinois. So uh, about uh, 10 miles south of Interstate 80 and about 15 miles east of Interstate 74 up there uh, by the Quad Cities. Been doing um, no-till cover crops and some other things for a while. And just kind of walk you through some of the things we, we see and uh, uh, coming and, and some really exciting things here in the future. So, um, fifth generation farm, and and when I when I look out over that hill there, I I see uh, all the good things that uh, five generations have done. I also get an opportunity to see all the mistakes we've made, and uh, a lot of erosion over the years because that used to be moldboard plowed up until about the late '80s, and hey, uh, now, yes, uh, we don't have your screen. Well, that's no fun. Let me try that again. Now, does that help? There we go. Perfect. Sorry about that. You would think after all the years of COVID and, and virtual meetings, I'd have this down by now, but uh, it never works flawlessly, does it? But... Uh, <laughs> That uh, that hill there is about a 40 acre hill and uh, C slopes and some D slopes and it was moldboard plowed up until like I said in 1988. So now we have a full court press trying to regenerate that soil and, and replace what's been lost. Uh, one of the things I like to say and a friend of mine does too is that sustainable agriculture just isn't enough because why would we want to sustain a degraded resource. So we're really looking at what all we can do to improve, regenerate, restore, and really make a more resilient farm long-term. So looking back in the past, um, you know, we had an abundance of crops and, and animals that we did on a 80 acres, you know, and both on my mom's side of the family and here on the my dad's side of the family had dairy and produce, a sawmill, a lot of diversity, a lot of different income streams. And yet today, here we are, corn and soybean, and uh, pretty, pretty simple, um, pretty um, lack of diversity. And I think there's a lot of things that um, this is kind of right before we started integrating a lot of the regenerative ag principles. We'd really gone as far as we could with no till. And uh, I've really come to the conclusion that no-till is not enough. So we're looking at what are those other things we can do. We started doing cover crops, started growing wheat, not supposed to do that in the corn belt. And we started doing a livestock integration and eventually direct to consumer marketing of that livestock. And um, so I want to kind of touch on four topics tonight for your, um, for your group. A little bit on the, what technology exists today to enable regenerative practices. There's a lot of things that we already have that we can put to work. Uh, what technology to integrate livestock onto cropland? You know, I spent my entire childhood uh, tearing down barns and taking out fences, uh, getting rid of wells because we need every square inch to farm for corn and beans. And uh, now what do we do when those resources are gone? Uh, you know, next thing is emerging technologies that are going to enable regenerative agriculture. It's pretty exciting to uh, see some of those things. And finally, uh, some of the trends to be aware of that, that I see happening and others see happening that I think are going to uh, really enable the possibilities of regenerative agriculture. So I think um, first it, it's important to start with some, some definitions and kind of our journey on our farm. And, and really we began in 1996 to minimize disturbance. So this is a combination of no tillage, uh, nutrient management to where 
we're, we're very specific on what we do in the minimal amount possible. We're trying to keep the soil covered, principle two. You know, I, I like what Practical Farmers of Iowa says, don't farm naked. Uh, those make great t-shirts and talking points with folks. Uh, the other thing is keep something growing all the time. And, and really that didn't happen until 2016 when I, when I came back home uh, to be at the farm. And because cover crops takes another level of effort and more people to, to make it happen. Then you have all those cover crops out there and you wonder, well, gee, why don't we eat them? So we try to integrate livestock and, and bring other small grains and stuff onto the farm. And one of the things that is just absolutely fascinating me because I've, I've worked with the first four principles in multiple environments, you know, here in Colorado, um, California, Kansas, Nebraska, Indiana, all over coaching farmers. And we can do all we want with uh, principles one through four. It's when we get to number five, that is just truly magical things happen. When we integrate livestock, almost has double the effect of one through four. So it's, uh, it's pretty amazing some of the things that are happening there. Now, it's not easy to do. And typically, the right thing to do is never really easy to do. But it is kind of fun to take a look when you get the principles working together, just what all this can look like. So I've got some audio on here that you should be able to hear. I'm just going to poke play on this uh, video. So sometimes people say you can't be prepared for weather extremes. Here's our field right here with cover crops, long-term no-till. Then we're just going to pan across the street right here. Here's tillage and no cover crops. Look at the standing water. Just drive along here a little bit. And this is the same slope, same soil type, side by side. But good air water management makes a big difference. So to me, it's just amazing to see that happening on flat ground, okay? And uh, imagine what's happening on our hillier ground. So residues and cover crops and soil health are, are a definite thing. And it, it's really great to see what happens because instead of sending nutrients off my land, soil off my land, and water off my land, we're storing all that to grow crops and, and put less energy inputs into our into our field and have soil for future generations. So um, this is a kind of an overview of some of the practices that we do at our farm. And we're gonna dive into a few of them here tonight. One is uh, the, the planter is uh, pretty advanced and it's amazing the technologies we have to enable regenerative agriculture with planting today. We're gonna dive into that a little bit. In the top center, you can see um, a couple maps, and this is where we were doing some work with planting double crop beans after wheat on the A and B slopes, but planting high diversity cover crop mixes on the C and D slopes. So why do we farm fields in squares? Why don't we farm fields by what their um, slope is? So it's uh, some novel work, and I think as automation comes forward, that's gonna be more and more a possibility. We can plant and get corn growing in heavy covers. That's on the top right. Uh, I've worked with 60 inch rows and intercropping and um, of cover crops and actually worked with intergrazing of cover crops within 60 inch rows. Um, bottom center is uh, companion cropping or I guess relay cropping would be the official term of wheat and soybeans. We've done that. Uh, standard practice for us on the bottom left is soybeans into green rye. And we leave a skip strip, I call it, where we plug a row every fourth row to be able to plant the 30 inch row soybeans or corn right between the standing cover crop. Just gives us a better opportunity for doing the right things we need to do in the seed trench. And then we have uh, what my dad calls the inter, uh, inter weeder instead of the interseeder, because he spent his entire life trying to get weeds out of crops and then here we go planting them into there. So. Um, those are some of the practices we're doing today that really anyone can do. So diving into the planter a little bit, and, and this is pretty exciting. Uh, six years ago, we built this planter, and it was just capable then to do it. Uh, I think there's some other people that are getting close to doing the same thing, but we can variable rate apply row by row three separate blends of fertilizer. So with the furrow jet, we have uh, one material going on seed. We have a different material going in the wings to either side. 
And then with conceal, we have a mainly nitrogen potassium source going on there. So five bands uh, indexed to the seed. And in fact, that's the very first time of the year that we put any nutrient in the field. So there's no fall applied P and K, no fall applied nitrogen. Our total diet to grow a corn crop, which uh, we averaged uh, 231.9 last year uh, with 175 units, 18, 23, 21S with micros and bios. Uh, in addition to the Y drop, the planter, we also do, uh, in addition to planter, we do Y drop side dress. And we'll do that once, sometimes twice, depending on the situation. The other element we do is uh, high diversity cover crops, not high definition, but uh, high diversity cover crops um, on every acre every year. And, and especially, you, you have a wonderful opportunity because uh, right around the Interstate 80 or maybe Illinois 17, we really run out of great opportunities for post uh, harvest planting of much other than rye. Uh, you have wonderful opportunities for ARG, you know, triticale, uh, many other diverse species in your mixes to get a benefit out of. And um, the surprising part is, is we did it for erosion, but we've actually found the best uh, benefit out of cover crops is weed suppression, uh, especially uh, resistant weeds and also water infiltration. A uh, huge, huge benefit of that. And uh, this a close up of planting green. Um, forget your residue managers. Don't need them. Uh, you'll cuss them if you run them. Uh, watch your closing wheels. Make sure you. I found that uh, Schlegels uh, don't work very well, or things that kind of reach out and grab don't work well. Uh, we're currently using the precision planting uh, uh, expensive, uh, what do they call them? Furrow something, furrow force. Um, and really like how those work. But if you do have a standing rye crop, this one's not too tall. We've had them where they're, you know, well over the planter bar. You want to make sure that you roll those uh, after termination so that you don't have the light competition for your cash crop. We found consistently two years and multiple replications. That's worth about seven bushel acre just to roll down that cover crop. Another thing here, wheat bean intercrop. Uh, my friend Jason Mock, uh, he's done a lot of this. Uh, he's more advanced at it, doing larger spacings. Uh, we've worked with this. We've had train wrecks. We've had success, and we've had, mm, okay. So it's a work in progress, but the concept here is we're turning that um, crop into a cash crop. Uh, do beware. Uh, we're able to grow this with no herbicides, you know, and increase carbon. And I think you get a nicer balanced residue out of this because you have the high carbon rye straw or wheat straw and the low carbon uh, soybean straw mixed together. So you have a little more persistent residue the next spring to protect your soil. I really like that. And which allows you to accumulate carbon better. Typically, you don't accumulate carbon in a soybean crop. So it's kind of nice to see that happening. But do beware if you're like me, grow non-GMO soybeans and you don't fully harvest all of the uh, uh, cereal grains. Those contain gluten. Non-GMO is used for food. So you will get rejected. So you have to have a backup plan for cleaning. Um, so there's a little more management involved with that. But it is an interesting way to add another two to $300 an acre revenue. So um, those are some of the things that involve in the first four principles, but I wanted to jump into what we first started off calling it as, as Project Moo, and that was really our attempt to bring livestock back to the land. We started with cattle, uh, some, some Hereford steers there, and then we bought uh, some cows, and now we're you know cow-calf to finish, all grass-fed, and we direct market those uh, to consumers. So We've kind of had to create our own marketing channel and supply chain there. Um, so everything from, you know, uh, bull selection to pack in the box and everything in between, we do. And it's provided some amazing opportunities for people to have uh, rural uh, job opportunities that they just didn't have before. After we got the customer, we integrated chicken because that's a healthy uh thing and we also in, integrated uh, uh, over there you can see sheep and there's also hogs now on the on the farm the sheep we uh, we no longer have because uh, lamb just isn't as big of a demand but uh, we continue with the, the large ruminants and that uh, started this company grateful graze and that's uh, our market name because uh, bottoms is hard to spell and hard to say and 
kind of confusing. So we just, <laughs> we uh, called it a, a brand that uh, people can uh, remember and identify with better. And uh, this is a picture of them eating cover crops. And it's, uh, it's an amazing thing. And, and they do really good um, health-wise and gain-wise on cover crops. Little overview of that, uh, we do a lot of outreach events. So FFA, um, Soils Judging Contest, a great way to utilize a field that's in several cover crops. Also tours, and we do a concert out in our pasture. Uh, down the lower left, that's a, a medical doctor, a cardiologist, and a chiropractor. That's a professor at um, uh, Palmer College in the Quad Cities. Both have been out to the farm, really supportive of what we do, and we've learned a lot about the health implications of, of what we're doing. And uh, it's it's great to, to, and I'm sure you that butcher your own animals uh, can agree, it's nothing like eating your own. And it's just, a, it's a real joy to be a part of that. But the neat part is, is you can raise great grass finished beef. Um, we do farm to table dinners and uh, this is our line of reserve beef. You can see there on the right, that's a T-bone with just a little bit of marbling in it. So how we do it, <clears throat> we, um, we believe everything should be movable. Uh, we try to mimic nature and mimic the bison herds that migrated from Canada to Mexico. So everything has to be portable and yet we have to keep them with our own context. So we do portable fencing, portable shade, mineral oils, um, water, everything, because we, we have nothing in there. So, um, you know, as soon as we can, after animals come out, you know, we are, this was just grazed and uh, you can see the hoof impact there. So it was spring grazed. We just moved them off to permanent pasture and we're coming in to overseed for our summer grazing crop. And uh, we'll just no-till right into that. Uh, cedar can handle it. And then also we can handle it with the uh, uh, Delta Force enabled grow crop planter. So we uh, uh, will typically do a two year rotation on those as we're, as we're going. Uh, so it'll be a corn bean, corn bean, and then we'll do two years regen and then come back to uh, corn bean. So uh, some other tools we use in technologies, this is available on your phone. It's called Pasture Map. We can pre-plan where animals are going to be. We can record everywhere they've been, know how soon we can come back and measure it. Um, it's a really handy resource uh, to be able to know exactly and plan ahead what our forage resources are, because the most expensive thing we can do is feed hay or, or silage or those kind of things. So we want them to optimize uh, grass grazing. And um, just some more screenshots of different paddock layouts that we've done at our farm. Uh, our permanent pasture on the right and uh, 160 acres of row crop on the left. They're getting one day in each one of those paddocks. So a little overview of what that regen rotation looks like. In 2021, we had fall seeded trit uh, in November. We had frost seeded clover in February. Um, there's our, I just got the dog in there for reference. On March 9th, there's not much going on. And then you look at May 6th and things are kind of happening. And then look, 16 days later, we've got cattle there who've grazed that. It just grows like crazy. And then um, we get the cattle out of there. And there we are on July 8th, planting the summer, summer covers. So I'm actually driving the truck, hauling cattle. Got two people hauling cattle, two people in the sorter and one guy seeding because we do not mess around. We want to capture every day of sunlight that we can. So the following year, uh, we overseeded uh, a tree to kale and that clover comes through. We can get, this is roughly five and a half big, I mean, huge round bales, five by sixes, uh, weighing 1,800 pounds uh, of baleage off of there. I mean, just, you like it when the tree kale is as tall as the 1842 tires on that tractor. That's pretty good forage. Then we direct seed into that, our summer grazing mix. And you can see this is on September 4th, the amount of biomass we're getting out of there. And then you got December 2nd, they're done. And we're seeding the rye uh, to go ahead and that'll be no-till soybeans right into it. So a uh, lot, of, lot of fun of, of what, we can, what we can do there. So how can we integrate technology a little bit? Well, we, we stumbled across a, a company in Norway it makes a invisible fence. It's a virtual fence. So every cow, 
cow wears a GPS receiver and she's connected to the internet. And in December of 21, we installed it on her. The collar still works perfectly today. And um, it'll upload a virtual boundary. And as she approaches that boundary, it gives her a little tone. And if she turns around, the tone goes down. If she keeps going, the tone keeps going up in pitch. And then she will receive an electric pulse and a correction for her to come back. And what I found was interesting when we got this installed on the entire herd, it only took us about five days to train them. Uh, unbelievable how well this works. Uh, we're, we're really excited about this technology and what it could mean for anyone who's uh, a crop grower. Um, give you a little bit of an overview here. Um, this is the app on my phone, some screenshots I took a while back. You can see where they're at, where we've restricted them to. It'll give you an idea of where they've grazed that day. And it's a good, uh, just an incredible management tool because now we can monitor the activity where they spend their time and we can really get to where we can move cows instead of just once a day, 10 times a day, and really do a great job of improving our land utilization. So like I said, the company's out in Norway. Um, today they have about 48,000 collars in service on 3,200 farms with 303 million hours. So uh, this isn't a maybe, this is definitely working. So we're excited to see them over here across the pond. They've currently got uh, 45 projects there that they're working with. And uh, it's pretty neat to see what all they're up to uh, across the United States. So they're currently doing bale grazing. Uh, so if you've ever done bale grazing in frozen ground, trying to put a fence post in frozen grounds, not much fun. But the virtually really works good. They're doing goat grazing for wildfire control in California, and they're doing sheep grazing under solar farms in Georgia. So the, the, the amount of how this tech can really bring livestock back to land is, is pretty fascinating. So people ask me what the cost is. Um, you know, here's a expected five-year life, 34 cents per day. Really what I'm looking at spending on labor and such is about that amount. So um, that pays for the units, but the, here's the interesting part is I can fence around ponds. I can give them access to a shoreline for a short period of time, and then I can restrict them. You know, I can give them access to timbers and restrict gullies where we couldn't go through before that uh, we can start to help restore that habitat and grasses there. We can exclude thin areas so we don't overgraze. We don't have to connect to the perimeter. It could be any shape or size. It's just incredible what this technology allows you to do so uh that's pretty exciting another thing here um you see the wire it may be a little hard to see but on the right there's a wire and then what do cattle like to do follow the wire so here's uh some muscatoon soil it's somewhat poorly drained like to follow the wire and just had a bunch of rain and for me to keep my um you know no-till i don't like to create that but where I had the no fence, there's no trailing. So this is a, a tremendous improvement in management capability. And uh, yeah, there's no more stampede into the next paddock of excitement. They're not standing there watching you set the next paddock. And the other fun thing is the calves don't have the collars. So they're able to graze ahead of the mothers and get the best bite. And we actually saw about a 38, 40 pound increase in calving weight this year. And I attribute that largely to this uh, ability to creep feed uh, that the calves have. They can go no wire to contain them back. Plus no more of this, you know, driving down all your beautiful forage to set a, set a line. But uh, anyway, I wanted to uh, just look a little bit and here's how I think this, this technology can come together with soil health and, and profitability is I think uh, no fence, there's sensors for the ear, the bolus, um, the tail to know everything about the animal. I think we can combine that with robotically driven water mineral oilers that we're currently working with a company out of Canada to develop for us. We can combine that with imagery to assess how much forage we have, how much quality of that forage, and then using machine learning or artificial intelligence, we can automatically generate paddocks based on growth and forecasts. And like I say, I, I want to make grazing so easy, even a corn farmer like me could do it, right? So there's a lot of skill involved with this 
And if we want to make an impact quickly, rather than taking 70 years or a lifetime to figure it out, why don't we utilize technology to help that? And, you know, I really believe here at the bottom, you know, feedlots exist because they're the most economical way to produce meat. But I also believe uh, technology can enable us to bring livestock back to the land if we can make it the most economical way to produce meat. So I, I think that's, that's a possibility that's out there. So before I go on, any, I've been blabbing for a while here uh, before I get into what some of the future tech startups are. Is there any particular questions or, or things that I need to clarify a little bit before I, I jump into what, what the future is holding here? It doesn't look like it right now. Well, I, they're sitting very still, so I'm worried that maybe we had a big <laughs> dinner and, and people have fallen asleep. You see, that's the, that's the problem. <laughs> well, I think everybody just taking it in right now, so. Okay. Well, very good. Very good. And um, well, I've, it, it's fun having being, being, uh, have the firsthand experience with this. And, and I hope that uh, others will, will go along this way. So in order to, you know, minimize disturbance and, you know, allow to grow more organic crops and overcome uh, resistant weeds and drift issues and all these things, I would, I would venture to say farmers, consumers alike, um, farmers would appreciate not having to spray herbicides. They would appreciate not having to purchase them. They would appreciate not accidentally drifting onto their neighbor and having claims and all those kind of things. And consumers would appreciate if we just plain didn't use them. And uh, I think there's some amazing opportunities that will, you know, one of the, my main problem with going organic is I have HEL ground and weed control and organic means tillage. And uh, I prefer to keep our soil in Illinois, not send it to Louisiana. So, you know, we're, we're just at a place where we can't do organic. But I really see the opportunity in robotics to allow us to do that. A couple of these, I have a pleasure of having a podcast called Ag Emerge. And I've been able to interview both founders uh, of these companies, and I think they both have unique opportunities. The one on the bottom uh, center there is called uh, Carbon Robotics, and this is their laser weeder. Uh, they're using this currently mainly in Salinas, Yuma, um, and Imperial Valley on carrots. But, uh, it, you know, in those type of produce situations, they're dealing with a clean field due to food safety regulations. So it can identify the difference between a very small lettuce or a very small carrot plant and even on like spring mixes where you have eight different uh, varieties planted on one bed, it can identify the weeds and it will send a laser and, um, uh, you know, fry the weed. It's really interesting to watch these uh, run. Uh, and anybody who's an Austin Powers fan, instead of sharks with laser beams, we have tractors with laser beams. So... It's, uh, it's kind of fun how that can work. And this has an opportunity in a residue situation because uh, imaging uh, technology and artificial intelligence will allow us to distinguish between a weed and residue. Uh, the only thing we'd want to be maybe a little careful of is if we're doing some really intense lasering on a really hot, dry day, that could be a little fun, but I'm sure we'll be able to figure that out. Uh, the other machine there on your right is uh, an early prototype of it and some, you know, a cooler looking form factor now. But uh, this is a novel approach. You, you, you got to love farmers when they, they put their heads together. So this is a farming family that developed this. It's called uh, Greenbuild Robotics. Their motto is bots, not chems. And um, it is actually a mower. So it is a mower that runs super close to the ground and it is autonomous and it senses the rows and it can drive itself down between rows. It has GPS location and all those things, but it uses a swarm concept where whatever, four to 20 of them will work in a field at one time and go down each row. And you might think, oh, well that just kind of goes down a row nice and slow. Oh no, these little suckers move. So they can actually do these operations up to five mile an hour on the individual rows. And uh, they've found, and they're working with some weed scientists, and they found that 
when you mow really close to the ground, uh, you know, even grasses will die, uh, especially with repeated uh, visits. So, you know, if it can run 24-7, 365, it can go through the field more than once. Uh, so that's uh, an interesting thing. And they're, they're approaching the market with uh, essentially weeding as a service. So you sign up with them and they'll, they'll come and uh, take the weeds out for a set fee per acre. So kind of an interesting thing. But that'll go a long way to help us with um, our, our needs in regards to um, uh, weeding and minimizing herbicide impact. Some other things, uh, uh, this is kind of interesting and, and I've been fortunate to connect with a lot of these through investments and in various incubators that I participate in. And uh, Jordan here is from Australia. Uh, he's not just wearing a cool hat for the heck of it. And he developed a system that uses a robot that's actually per perfectly positioned behind him because he didn't want to uh, show it off to the world just yet. But he uses a robot that agitates um, the sludge just on the surface with very low energy. It's completely solar driven. There's no heating. There's no fans. All he uses is ambient a humidity grade difference and, and ambient wind direction to dry out lagoon manure. And he can dry it uh, about in 45 days, what would normally have taken six to nine months in the past. So, so what, right? But he makes a more consistent product. He's able to do value add product mixing with this little robotic tool and creates almost a perfectly pelletized manure that is organically approved, that you can, uh, very concentrated, that you can send. So anywhere across the United States. So we're looking at partnering with him to take this high value product he's generating in North Carolina, actually economically makes sense to rail to California to apply on organic crops out there. So it's amazing to see how you can especially, I think this is very regenerative, taking a waste stream or a, a waste product that was kind of applied to fields just because you had to, not because you wanted to, but turn it into a high value uh, resource robust product that can be uh, create high value outcomes. I, that, I get excited about that stuff. Maybe you've seen this one. Uh, this was pitched to us and uh, got to meet the founder uh, as part of Ag Startup Engine out of Iowa State. Uh, pretty neat. I really think, uh, you know, the future of farming is smaller, one to eight rows. Uh, main reason we have these 600 plus horsepower tractors and who knows how many row planters and 16 row combines is because there's only one guy to run the machine we have a serious labor crisis. So we try to make the farmer more and more efficient. Well, when you don't need an operator, you can have multiple machines and they can run on their own. You know, computers are a little easier to copy than farmers. So that's, uh, that's exciting. And, and there's lots of change. You know, you look at AutoCart. Uh, I was a participant in that one with Colin Hurd. And uh, also Harry Stein was a big supporter of that. It and uh, Dot out of Canada was acquired by Raven. And that got CNH is uh, so excited about 18 months later, CNH acquired Raven. So lots of consolidation and things happening there. But uh, the videos here on the on the website for Salen are, are just pretty cool. You know, um, so it's essentially a, a four row planner bar uh, with everything precision planning on it. You add on some sousy tracks, you add on some machine learning intelligence, a GPS receiver, and uh, there you go. The cool part is he don't have to stop to pee. You know, he don't have to stop to get lunch. He, 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 his back doesn't get sore, um, you know, and he goes all night. He doesn't get tired, and, and he just, just keeps going all the time, and that, that is a wonderful thing. Um, and I think we can really get those operational jobs done by robots and do the higher value management jobs by humans. So lots of exciting stuff there. And I think, you know, it really takes a different way of looking at things, right? And we need to 
to really realize that we can't just doing incremental improvements in bushels per acre or dollars per acre, keep doing the conventional system just a little bit better and hope that it gets better. You know, we're at a time when technology is going to allow us to, to make a leap jump and, and go from candles to light bulbs. And I, I think that's, uh, that's pretty exciting. And, and it's definitely here and it's going to happen very, very fast. Um, so that's a few, few examples of, of some of those things. Uh, final section here I wanted to visit with you all about, just kind of make you aware of, I, I think, is the trends um, that we have going forward. Um, you know, I look at opportunities for carbon sequestration uh, and greenhouse gas uh, mitigation at the farm level. You know, no-till corn, you can get about 10% organic matter increase per year. If, if we roll down cover crops, I see, a, again, pretty consistently, if we have high biomass headed out, cover crops about a 10th percent per year. Then if you integrate livestock and, and grow those and let them regrow, uh, two tenths percent is, is fairly attainable. Uh, now, it'll take many years to get that all fleshed out, but that's, that's what Dwayne Beck's seen for 20 years and others, but you know, I'm seeing those kind of things now, too. The other thing I think is a huge opportunity is uh, nitrous oxide reductions because it's, you know, 298 times more uh, potent than carbon dioxide in greenhouse gases. You know, limit the in applications from planting on. Anytime we're putting nitrogen in the field, when there's not a cash crop growing, uh, we're at risk of losing it, whether it's one day or six months ahead. You know, uh, there, there will become a time when ammonia in the fall is just not is going to be illegal. That's all there is to it. Um, you know, we need to limit the amount of nitrogen we apply at any one time. The science tells us that the microbial community shuts down when we over apply nitrogen. So our free living nitrogen fixing microbes, you know, go on welfare instead of be working for us. And uh, we get to buy more fertilizer from the dealer. And uh, no one really wins well the dealer wins at that i suppose you know using stabilizers inhibitors putting it into the soil instead of broadcasting on the top i mean all these are best management practices that we know you know paying attention to residue and crop carbon nitrogen ratio like i said increasing the carbon content of your soybean stubble great way to add carbon to your soil you know and and avoid creating waterlogged soils you know nitrate reduction um because the oxygen scavengers will take the oxygen off a of nitrate and then what do you have left nitrous oxide so making sure we're doing everything possible to have good internal drainage you know i think we also need to be pre preparing for a changing business climate uh, i'm really looking into multiple revenue streams per acre per year that has to be a thing whether i'm growing meat and then i grow corn after that or wheat and then grow meat after the wheat wheat and double crop soybeans, you know, corn and soy alternatives, because there's a tremendous number of allergies out there now to corn and soy. I think there's opportunities to grow these feedstuffs for chicken, uh, poultry, and egg production. You know, I, other question I ask is how can, how can you harvest more energy per acre per year? You know, 120 day corn uh, to maturity, there's 365 days in a year. So we're wasting two thirds of our energy. How can we capture more of that energy that's falling on every acre? And how can we harvest higher value energy every year? There are higher value things that we can harvest off of a crop than just corn and soy. And, and how can we do that? For example, my pasture broilers, those are worth about uh, $1,800 an acre of gross profit. So how can we, how can we harvest more of that? Uh, corn prices are really good right now, but that might get 1800 gross revenue, but it's not getting gross profit. And then the other thing is, is how, how can you keep more of the value? Why are we giving all the money to ADM or giving it to JBS? How do we keep it in our own pockets? The other thing I think we need to look at is really the, the whole regulatory climate. You know, what, what's your plan for environmental regulations, uh, water, air, groundwater, you know, nitrogen, carbon, all these regulations. Is there uh, a plan for that? But I really see there's, there's ecosystem services revenue streams. 
um, labor regula regulations. How are we going to deal with minimum wage, work week, all this thing? You know, how can we minimize the simple, make it automated, make it robotic, but maximize the valuable, the management, the planning, and those kind of things. Uh, as, as farmers, we, we just can't be tractor drivers. We, we got to be really thinking ahead on, on how we can maximize our resiliency. So, you know, what if, and rather than complaining about regulations and, and regulations, why, why, why don't we look at these as ability to produce more income? Finally, some industry trends, and this is in the meat business because I'm quickly converting to a, a, a meat producer more so than a corn and soybean farmer. But uh, it's amazing uh, what, what is going on there. Um, I won't uh, take a lot of time on this, but there is really hope in grass-fed and finished regenerative raised meat. If you look at my friend uh, Will Harris, uh, White, White Oak Pastures, for every pound of ground beef he creates, he sequesters three and a half pounds of carbon. Where in the feedlot, they emit 33 pounds of carbon for every pound of meat they produce. That's going to catch up to us. And uh, masks and butt gatherers or butt collectors on a cow to eliminate methane isn't the answer. The answer is pretty simple. Uh, do, let them do what they're designed to do. So finally here, uh, this is what I'm looking at on my farm. Uh, really, my future revenue stream is uh, my goal is to triple land revenue with regenerative agriculture. And uh, uh, I, I really look at not just growing crop production, but I want to have a third of my revenue coming from value added enterprises. So companion cropping, you know, integrating livestock premiums, direct marketing. And I really believe by doing the soil health principles in farming in a regenerative manner, we can get the carbon credits, we can get water, uh, you know, water and quality improvements, uh, nature incentives, some Audubon Society or other groups that will pay us to do these things to where a third of our revenue in the future is going to be ecosystem services related. So that's, uh, that's how I think we triple uh, the value of what we're doing on every acre. And, and that's the direction that we're headed and, and want to head. So sometimes doing what we've always done gets us what we've always got. And uh, this is one of my favorite quotes is, uh, what did me in was not what I did not know. It was the things I knew, which were not so. So knowing that cattle have to be in the feedlot or knowing that we have to grow, grow just corn and soybeans or knowing that, ah, those cover crops don't work. It, uh, it may do you in. So take a fresh perspective, really look at how you can uh, change your farm and, and coach those that you're working with to do, do things better. So i uh, been blessed with many opportunities from the business we started in California to the farm in Illinois, uh, our wholesale biological fertilizer business based in Moline is ASN and uh, Grateful Gray is the direct -to consumer company. And then the podcast is uh, really the purpose of the podcast is to bring thought leaders researchers, farmers, and ag technologists together to think about what the future of farming can be and how we can move to a more profitable paradigm and definitely a more soil health focused and environmentally friendly and a farmer friendly, uh, rewarding lifestyle uh, type of a business and ag paradigm in the future. So tune into that. It's become really popular and get a lot of great feedback. So uh, happy to provide that resource for folks. All right. Did I put them all to sleep for sure now? <laughs> no, I think everybody's awake still. So um, good. thank you much. Has anybody got any questions? Yep, we got one question here. Oh, good. Um, did you experience any increased pest pressure uh, on the fields that you were doing the intercropping? like voles or rodents uh, as far as pest pressure on the companion cropping you were asking on the soybean and rye or soybean and wheat um, really did not have any sort of um, uh, pest pressure on there uh, so that was um, in fact um, I did it 
two years with zero herbicides applied too, because the winter cereal was suppressive of the broadleafs within the non-GMO bean system. So that, that was really exciting and no fungicides applied. And I harvest this for, uh, I harvest the rye for seed. So first year was wheat, last two years have been uh, rye for seed for my own cover crops. And with no fungicides applied, we had 94% germ on our Elbon rye. Uh, so I, I was pretty excited about that. Okay. Yep. Oh, Another I, question for I, Michelle. Yep. Okay. Um, so when you're doing the, the intercropping, are you harvesting those to be marketed? The, the, if you're, when you run two different crops? And if so, how are you doing that? So I harvest, the first year I harvested wheat and that was marketed. The wheat was harvested. I have um, a flexi finger. Um, what do they call them? Flexi select is what they call them. So they're like uh, fingers that you'd run in uh, peas or maybe Milo or something like that on your cutter bar. And it just basically uh, runs a poly um, thing that protects the bean plant from getting the uh, top or the apical meristem cut off by the cutter bar. And then the wheat feeds in and you cut that. Uh, two problems. One is, is if you do cut that soybean or right, drive over it, you reduce your yield. And uh, the other thing is, is if you leave too much of the cereal grains in there and, and you're going for those food grade type of things, you will get a, a rejection because uh, gluten is not allowed. Um, but uh, the last two years I've been harvesting seed for myself. So I tried, I grew 64 bushel wheat the first year. I harvested incorrectly and had like 40 bushel beans. So can't do that. Then I, my focus became, I want to maximize the soybean crop. And I want to try to get some cereal crop, but the cereal crop is going to be my herbicide program, my soil health program, and an additional revenue stream. So like last year, I had 140 acres of it. I harvested that for my cereal rye. I sold some to neighbors. I planted some myself. And uh, um, I got on rye, uh, 16 bushel, which doesn't sound very exciting. But when you look at it for seed purposes, that was, I, I can pull up the spreadsheet real quick, but um that was selling for 20, what, four cents a pound or something. I have to look that up. It, 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 the, it was, I would rather do rye than wheat because the, the rye I can grow and use myself and it's uh, just as profitable as wheat. No supplemental nitrogen too, by the way. All right. I think we had, uh, we had one online there from uh, Bill Farmer. Okay, let me see if I can figure out how to read that. There's a chat. All right, Monty, did you have any increased insect pressure in the corn following the cover crops? Uh, in our standard cover crops, no. In the companion crop, I have had uh, army worm because what happens, oh, and by the way, here's another benefit of the companion crop. We let some come out the back of the combine and spread it. I don't have to seed the following fall because we have the rye has reseeded itself. So that saves $22 of a cover crop seeder and the seed's already out there. However, because that is green earlier, it does attract army worm. So we have had issues in regards to um, this plan where we will have army worm that we have to scout for and treat about 50 to 70% of the time in the corn that follows that. So that that is a shortcoming of that of that uh, system. Any? The, uh, on your rate for your super rye, you pound breaker to get good jump, to get good weed control, how much do you use? So a lot of echo going on on my end, but I believe the question was in regards to what is the pounds of cereal rye that you use? I use 40, 45 pounds of cereal rye on my three-line system, pre-plant or pre-fall 
ahead of the beans that I'm going to terminate, I use uh, 10 to 15 pounds per acre on the companion crop scenario because I don't want to have too much light interaction. So again, I don't want to have a real thick stand. I just want enough to suppress the weeds, enough to get a little bit of rye out of it, but still grow good soybeans. Do you have much trouble with water hemp? Do I have much trouble with water hemp? I have water hemp in some fields. Uh, water hemp is largely driven by, uh, if you've read into any of the work done by Jay McCammon and others, uh, it's a good thing to venture into the organic world and read some of the resources. And he has a thing called When Weeds Talk. And you will find that um, those are typically a result of excess nitrogen application or residual nitrogen from the previous crop. Because I'm so judicious in what we're doing in the timing and location and rate of the nitrogen that we're doing, traditionally water hemp is a minimal problem for me. Adjacent fields, we, we grow it pretty good. So that's, uh, that's a management thing. And I think also it's a, a you know, historical mode of action. Uh, we always try to go for four modes of action uh, when we're out there with herbicides. Michelle's got another one here. Good. She's winning the prize. I mean, that's great. Um, you, you, you think you would find it more, pro is it more profitable with livestock for you? Um, I mean, obviously my answer itself, but like if you didn't have the cow and you were just farming, you know, the, the grains, would you be, would you be incentivized to put livestock on your fields to be more profitable? Have you found it to be more profitable if you did not have cattle or pasture? Okay, so because of the audio, um, it's a little bit, it, the question is in regards to having cattle versus not having cattle. Uh, can someone closer to the microphone repeat that for me? Yes. Is it, is it obviously by having the cattle, you have the increased, you have that additional revenue stream, but if you don't currently have cattle, is the incentive enough there in order to add cattle into your operation? Very right. good. I didn't, I did not have cattle. I'd raised a total of three bucket steers when I was in 4-H. Family had no cattle. I purchased everything from scratch. I saw, I started borrowing 16 pairs from the neighbor. Okay. I called up the neighbor and said, hey, I'll graze your cattle. I won't charge you a thing. And I'll try not to kill them. I can't guarantee it because I don't know anything. He kind of laughed. He brought them over anyway. So I guess he didn't like them too much or he didn't care if I was going to kill them. But anyway, we were successful. Didn't kill his cows. That makes for good neighbor relations. And I saw what it was doing. I thought, hmm, this is interesting. So then I bought the 18 steers, did that. And then after I saw the subsequent crop in the areas where we grazed, I'm like, there's definitely something to this. I also got to admit, I went up to Gabe Brown's in 2016, dug in his soil, toured his entire farm, saw what he was doing. Because when he's claiming the 11% organic matter after integrating, going from six to 11 after integrating cattle, there's two things that cross your mind. One, either you say, this guy's completely full of crap. Or number two is, if he isn't, I need to do what he's doing. So rather than just being satisfied with, you know, thinking he's full of crap, I went to verify and he's not. Uh, it's the real deal. Uh, you're accumulating carbon at ways that have just never been documented in peer-reviewed research. So we went to do that. I have C and D slopes now on that farm that I first showed at the beginning that were lucky to yield 120 bushels on those side hills. I can consistently pull 180 to 185 all the time now after two years of livestock integration. I did it for soil health because I had cattle and had created a higher value resource rather than just give it away at the sale barn. I created the marketing company to be an opportunist and 
capture all of the revenue I'm gaining. So it all started with soil health, but it all comes back to making the farm more vital. If you would ask my great grandfather, hey, why do you have livestock? Just plant corn and beans. He would have looked at you like you were nuts. If our great grandparents could come back and see how we farm today, I'm not sure if they would slap us or kick us, but it's, it's so out of context from what they did. And who's right? And I, I, I tend to think that uh, at one time when I was, you know, 20 years ago, thought well, that was a stupid way to do it. I, I think they knew a lot more than what we did. And uh, it, it's interesting. But yes, um, I did not have cattle. I got cattle to improve soil health. And then I got chickens to do that, too. And um, uh, it's, uh, it's all integrated. So, uh, Monty, at what point or what's your what's your slaughter weight whenever you're bringing uh, steers in? Yeah. And how long does it take you to get to that point? So it varies by frame size. Uh, we will finish some animals will finish at uh, 1050. Some will finish at 1480. So we have a various amount of frame sizes. Typically in grass fed, you want a smaller frame because you have less maintenance requirement than the energy density of grass is poorer compared to grain. Therefore, you have to keep the rumen full of something that's, that's less. So the bigger the animal you have to maintain, the harder it is to put fat on. Uh, we typically harvest, we, are, we uh, birth on green pasture May 15th to July 4th. We then subsequently harvest August to October, two years and plus later. So 24 to 28 months on the finish, which will be anywhere from eight to 14 months more than a feedlot scenario. Okay. Any other questions? They were slow to start, but then they came in there at the end for you. So. Oh, yeah, they're, they're good questions. I appreciate that. I mean, I, I don't get me wrong. I, you can probably tell by the amount of time I spent on it. I have, I have done a lot of things in cropping systems research and, and you know, nutrition research for many, many years. And uh, the animal integration, uh, it is mind blowing the impact on the soil when it's done correctly it's just mind blowing so i guess uh just to kind of build off the cattle side of it there after hearing you know it takes a little bit longer there obviously on the grass-fed side um mm -hmm. if since you have a grass fed, obviously you're going, you know, hundred percent grass fed. If you were to supplement that, um, would you, you know, in your estimation or in other folks that you've worked with, are you going to see, uh, the same benefits on the land as, uh, if you were supplementing that with other feed sources besides grass on, on those cows in order to get them fed out quicker so that's a great question and we could there's two parts to your question i, I think that i'm that i'm hearing so i'm going to simplify this for the soil health benefit you could be a cow calf producer who's 100 percent grass-fed anyway get the soil health benefit the soil doesn't really care if it's a mama cow with a calf or if it's a fat steer it wants a rumen eating the grass and uh, putting out the wonderfully processed grass out the rear end now as far as uh, if you want to go to corn fed to improve your time, absolutely you can. But I like selling my ground beef for eight fifty a pound, and I don't like competing with five dollar a pound ground beef at the grocery store. So I have a unique product that people are willing to go to an online experience to purchase, versus competing with JBS at a grocery store. That's a bloodbath. So that that marketing channel is mature with multi-billion dollar multinational players. Here I am, one little guy with 150 head of cattle in Henry County that's to squash me like a little grape, you know. 
So um, we went to the market that, that we can do. Now, as long as you have cattle on the land, you're going to make the positive soil health impact. I was doing it for the business enterprise of that. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, that was, yeah, that, you answered my question. Or, or if you're, let's say you're a feedlot producer and you want to background some cattle that just came in and weaned, hey, cover crops are a great way to background and you could creep feed them some. You could, uh, you know, mama cows out there. Uh, we can get on those summer cover crops, we average anywhere from 308 to 342 pounds per day gain. So it, it's incredible what you can do there. You just can't do that 365 like you can in the feedlot. Right. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, we greatly appreciate your time. And um, we did record this, so we will be sticking this out on our on our uh, uh, soil and water our county website in order for other folks to uh, catch up with it that weren't able to attend tonight. So uh, just to let you know that. And